Welcome to the Play Podcast with me, Douglas Schatz. Hello, and welcome to episode 44 of the Play Podcast, where we explore the greatest new and classic plays. I'm Douglas Schatz, founder and host of the Play Podcast. The curtain rises on the interior of a modest three-bedroom bungalow at 406 Clybourne Street in Chicago. Cardboard boxes are stacked in corners. Some furniture has been removed, carpets rolled up. The owners of this house are clearly in the process of moving out. A white man in his 40s, Russ, sits alone on one of the remaining chairs, idly reading National Geographic magazine and slowly eating ice cream straight from the carton. After a few minutes, his wife Bev appears, followed by Francine, both busy packing up. Francine is black and wears a maid's uniform. It is September 1959. The address of Russ and Bev's house is important because it is about to become the first property in the white middle-class neighborhood of Clybourne Park to be sold to a black family, much to the consternation of some in the local community. The proposed sale of their house sparks heated debates between neighbors, which continue even 50 years later when we meet the next generation who want to purchase Russ and Bev's property. This is Bruce Norris's provocative play, Clybourne Park, which highlights our continuing anxieties and dysfunction over race, our obsession with property ownership, and the challenges of accepting and adapting to changing multiculturalism in our societies. The play premiered in New York in February 2010, winning the 2011 Pulitzer Prize for Drama and the 2012 Tony Award for Best Play. It received its first UK production at the Royal Court in September 2010, transferred to the West End in February 2011, winning an Olivier Award for Best New Play. The playwright Bruce Norris started his theatrical life as an actor, appearing on stage on Broadway several times before turning to writing. He's authored more than a dozen plays, the last seven of which have been produced by the Steppenwolf Theatre in Chicago. His 2013 play, The Low Road, like Clybourne Park, was also staged at the Royal Court in London, and his most recent play, Downstate, which is set in a house in Downstate, Illinois, that is shared by four men convicted of sex crimes, was co-produced with the National Theatre in 2019. Clybourne Park is currently being revived at the Park Theatre in London in a thought-provoking and coruscatingly funny new production directed by Oliver Catterby. And I'm delighted that Oliver has joined me on the podcast today, from the wilds of Wales, in fact, to share his insights on this absorbing play. Welcome, Oliver. Thanks for joining us. Hi, Douglas. Thanks so much for having me. Well, I need to do a very brief proper introduction to you. Oliver is an actor, director, producer, and founder of the devising theater company, Delirium. In addition to the shows that he has produced for Delirium, his credits include a long list of roles as an actor and director, too numerous to list here. He was the assistant director on the wonderful production of Jesus Christ Superstar at Regent's Park, as well as the director of shows at Chichester, the Union Theater, and the Vaults Festival. You can find more of his credits on our website in due course. So, Oliver, the first thing I'm interested in is when did you first come across Clybourne Park and what was it about the play that drew you to want to revive it at this time? So I completely missed it when it was in London. So actually, I wasn't aware of the play until I went to North Carolina. I went to actually visit my younger brother who was studying at the University of North Carolina. And on wandering around the campus, we discovered that the theatre, incredible uh, theatre facilities, are run by a company called Playmakers Rep. And they happen to be showing A Raisin in the Sun and Clybourne Park in Rep. Oh, wow. So we just bought tickets and uh, went along. And watching the play for me was like a bombshell. It was just the most extraordinary experience, you know, in the South, in America, in what is essentially a democratic enclave in what is otherwise a, a fairly Republican state. And Playmakers are an extraordinary company. They've managed to develop an amazing returning audience. But the majority of that audience are white middle class. And so it was really interesting to experience that surrounded by these people and 
right at the end, as I sat there kind of shell shocked by what I had experienced, I just sat for a moment and the fellow in front of me was an older white man. And he just simply said, well, what goes around comes around. Ah, brilliant. (laughs) And I thought, well, that is the most extraordinary, neat bromide to summarize everything that had just happened where I was still trying to catch my breath. And that for me felt like the moment where I felt like I needed to further investigate it as a play. Oh, that's brilliant. An amazing setting. So let's let's share a bit more with the listeners about why that's an amazing setting. What we like to do is to, to give listeners some idea about what actually happens in the play for those who don't know it. So I wonder if I could prevail upon you, Oliver, to give us a, a brief summary. Now, don't worry about spoilers because inevitably we're going to get into the detail and depth of the play. So let's uh, let's have a go. Well, you set it up beautifully in your introduction. It opens in 1959 Chicago and in a house which is occupied by Russ and Bev, who are a middle class white family. And it transpires that they are mourning the death of their son, Kenneth, who had committed suicide after returning from the war in Korea. And they've sold their house, therefore, The explicit reason is because Russ has received a a promotion at work, and so they want to be closer to his new office. The implicit suggestion is that they want to remove themselves from this house where their son died. And so as a result, they've sold the house at a reduced rate and have done so by just handing over the responsibility to a local estate agent. And he has sold the house to a black family. Now, For anybody that knows A Raisin in the Sun by Lorraine Hansberry, a 1959 play, extraordinary 1959 play, they will have heard the story of a black family buying a property in a white neighborhood. And that is the exact black family that is being referred to in Clybourne Park. They're never referred to by name, but we know that they are the same family because there is a crossover character which is the character of Carl Lidner, who exists in A Raisin in the Sun, turns up towards the end of the play to try to purchase the house from Lorraine Hansberry's family, which are the younger family. And in Clybourne Park, he turns up having just had that meeting to the house, to Russ and Bev, to try to convince them not to sell the house to the younger family because he had failed in trying to purchase it from them. So Carl is a member of the local community association. He's a Rotarian and he seems to take it upon himself to try to, in some way, maintain his understanding of what his neighborhood is, which is this white middle class neighborhood and does it with a great deal of, uh, or, or a lack, I should say, of tact at times by bringing into the conversation Francine, who you mentioned, who is Russ and Bev's maid, her husband, who happens to turn up to pick her up after work, the local priest, who has been brought in by Bev to try and speak to Russ, who is in the depths of a depression following the death of Kenneth. So suddenly there's this this representation of the local community, which also includes Carl's wife, who happens to be both pregnant and congenitally deaf. So we have within this sort of distilled example of the local community, examples of people who have varying lived experiences. And so Bruce uses that as an opportunity to have what begins as a conversation around language and then turns into a conversation which focuses more on ideas of ownership, both one's ownership of property, but also one's ownership of ideas and concepts and the very concept of neighborhood and what that is. Obviously, by there being a priest, there is the opportunity to explore faith. By Betsy being there, there's the opportunity to explore disability. So he does. And he very deftly and with a huge amount of nuance, to my mind, manages to craft this conversation which touches upon 
all of the hot topics of Western society. And obviously, in the first act, that's built on the framework of 1950s American society. Can I just interrupt now as we got, I think, instinctively towards the interval? Yes, we did. Which is quite a demarcation in this play, which we'll talk about. But I wanted to just pick up on you were talking about the connection with Lorraine Hansbury and the black family moving into the white neighborhood and the connection between this play and hers. I was fascinated to discover that this is based on Hansbury's real life, isn't it? This actually happened to her family. Yeah, that's right. So a version of this happened to her family. Her father was able to buy a house in a white neighborhood. And ultimately, that house came under attack with things being thrown through windows, I believe, including firebombs. Oh, my God. Yeah, they, they were not treated very well at all. But it was a really important moment in American history because her father fought it through the courts and won. So he won the right to purchase that house. So her father bought the house, as you said, but the local housing association took out an injunction to prevent them from moving in, which he challenged in the courts. And it went all the way to the Supreme Court. And finally, he won and the restrictive covenant was rejected. And this led me to do some research about the term restrictive covenant. These were legal documents that were in widespread use starting in the 1920s, I think, in the United States, and were an instrument for enforcing racial segregation in towns and cities. And I came across a direct quote from one of them that reads as follows. Said premises shall not be rented, leased, or conveyed to or occupied by any person other than of the white or Caucasian race. Extraordinary, isn't it, really? 90% of the housing projects built in the years immediately following World War II were racially restricted by covenants. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I had no idea this legal infrastructure was so widespread. And it was finally overturned or declared unenforceable in 1948 by the Supreme Court. Though I don't suppose that prevented it unofficially from being practiced, as we discover here in 1959. Absolutely. And I think what's really interesting is that Bruce avoids talking about anything legal. He talks at one point about the right of a seller to place a property into receivership. But what we found interesting to explore is how the the support system of having a framework such as the one you've just described in place in law, actually then it's more about how that leads to people allowing those laws to become human laws ingrained into their understanding of the world. And so actually the fight is a, a psychological one. It's an internal one because what Carl is trying to do is to appeal to the, the hearts and the minds of Bev and Russ by saying, this is going to ultimately impact us, the people you're leaving behind, the people who were your neighbors, please don't do that to us. And so it's very much a, a plea rather than, as you say, because it couldn't have been enforced in law in 1959, but it's a plea that's based on their experience of the world and what the world was and what they had access to, and, you know, the status quo, if you like. And the assumption, though, that underlying it that is so shocking, of course, is that this is a bad thing. He says that, as you just described, that actually don't do this to us. What What is he doing to them? Carl's argument, of course, is that it's going to devalue the properties all of them live in. But, you know, there's obviously more to it than that. Something about, of course, preserving this way of life, this community as they've defined it, that they're comfortable with, that somehow would be threatened. Absolutely. It's a mentality that we see today. The idea of, you know, this is mine. I want to protect what's mine. How often do we hear about people just completely losing their minds over property boundary arguments. You know, just this idea of this piece of land is mine and I own it and I've worked for it and it's mine, I want to protect it, however small that might be. This is partly signal, I guess, at the beginning of the second act where they are absorbed in and obsessed by the minutiae of these documents that relate to the exchange of the property and the definition of the property, its frontage and its height and all that stuff. <laughs> I think we'd also come to the point, of course, that the context about arguing over one house and neighborhood 
can obviously be extended to immigration into a country, for example, and, and the protection of our borders of the country as opposed to just of this neighborhood. Absolutely. But let's talk about what happens in the second half of the play, because there's an extraordinary structure to this play, isn't there, that we move on 50 years to a whole new set of characters. So, yes, yeah, so it's the same seven actors playing, as you say, a whole new set of characters 50 years later. Uh, so we find ourselves now in 2009. And importantly, that is during the Obama administration. And we find this group of characters who are in the exact same house, but it's described at the top of the act that the house has changed significantly in terms of its having become run down in various ways. And we now have a white couple who have bought this house in what we discover to be uh, a now predominantly black neighborhood. They're joined by their white solicitor. And there's a black couple who represent the local community, the new community association, I suppose. And it seems to be a conversation about the plans that this incoming white couple have to completely demolish the existing house and to build a new house on that plot of land. And the black couple are there to argue the defense of the neighborhood and the architectural uh, integrity. Yeah, architectural integrity and the overall aesthetic of the neighborhood and how important that is. Because they want to build a bigger house, not in keeping with the existing vernacular architecture. Exactly. And so then over the course of this uh, second act, we explore similar themes to the first act, but in a different way. And it returns again very much to a conversation over the ideas of language and what is and isn't acceptable to say, um, and also the overriding idea of offence and what is or isn't offensive and who can or can't be offended by something. Yes. Well, a lot of offence goes on. Yes. I mean, one that fascinates me about it as well is how clever and neat the structure is. The way the second act mirrors the first in so many ways is very effective, isn't it? So in the most general way, we have in the first act, a black couple moving into an all white neighborhood. 50 years on that neighborhood's been transformed and it's the reverse. So we have the inverse in the second act where the white couple's moving in to the black neighborhood. That's right. Yeah. So there's a lot of opposites and there's a lot of comparables. So he does have certain characters in the second act who are direct descendants of the characters who we meet in the first act or who are spoken about in the first act. So there's bloodline descendants, but then there's also characters that exist for an actor that are the complete opposite of the sorts of characters they've played in the previous act. So for example, Imogen Stubbs plays Bev in the first act, who is a very much a 1950s housewife, is very much concerned about keeping up appearances. And then Imogen plays Kathy in the second act, who is this sort of quite hard-nosed lawyer working at high level. So it's a real kind of mix of comparisons, opposites and contrasts. Yeah, and of course, you're able to chart what's happened and the differences in the intervening years, aren't you? I mean, as you mentioned, the fabric of the house even is deteriorated, so the neighborhood has declined. You see that, but also the differences between the characters who they played in the first half and the second, as you say. So Francine and Albert, Francine is the black maid in the first half, and Albert, her husband, who comes to collect her. The young black couple who represent the housing association in the second act. Lena and Kevin are played by the same actors. And what's interesting is that you immediately see they are now from a completely different social strata. Kevin mm -hmm. works for Capital Equities or some such financial company in the city. He works in the building opposite Lindsay and works with a school friend of Steve so that they've come together. They, obviously, the black couple in some respects has come up in the world and now are on relatively equal footing with the white couple who are, are moving in. And it's through that doubling up that he brings into sharp relief these kind of changes that, that have gone on in the 50 years intervening. That's right. And by putting those two couples, as you say, in a relatively equal societal position, it then makes 
even more stark the differences between those couples in terms of their lived experience and what they have to uh, endure, what the black couple have to endure daily that the white couple don't as a result simply of their race. Clearly, as we've touched on, one of the primary elements of this play is that it's a discourse about race. And it's very explicit in the first act, as we said, Carl's objection to the colored family moving into the neighborhood. And when he shares his objection, it's quite a shocking moment, isn't it? He talks about what sort of people the family are buying the house are, the sort being that they're colored. And that simply is enough that for this to be a disaster for the neighborhood. And in fact, there is such an assumption, I suppose, that even though it's not legal, the reverend, the priest, Jim, believes that the real estate agent would never have allowed this to happen. <laughs> Whether it's legal or not, this couldn't be right. This can't be happening. That's right. I like the way that the play depicts both conscious and unconscious racism. And it's really subtly drawn, isn't it? In, in 1959, the way that, say, Bev in particular, displays all sorts of unconscious racism about which she's not even aware. Yeah, I, I think so. So again, it's one of the reasons why this play is still so important 12 years after it was originally presented is because we've recently been having these conversations about conscious and unconscious bias. And the easy option would be to, to paint Bev as 100% a product of her society and, and her upbringing. And actually, she is in the way that she treats Francine to begin with. And she isn't consciously trying to be in any way dismissive or offensive or, as you say, explicitly racist. She is just a product of her time. So she appears to be that way through a contemporary lens. However, she then turns out later on to argue in favor of the neighborhood becoming a more multicultural neighborhood and to argue about why that would be such a bad thing. And actually the, the first act ends with her talking about how society would potentially be better if we could all find a way of better understanding each other. Now, she doesn't necessarily have the perhaps emotional intelligence to be able to frame that in a way that is more complex than the way that she does, which is to make this kind of feeble suggestion that everybody should learn what the other culture eats and that that would go some way to, to softening the divide. But I think it would be it's one of the things that I like most about the way in which Bruce writes is that he has created such complex and three-dimensional characters. It would be easier to write Carl as simply a racist and make him easy to write off as an audience. But actually, my belief is that Carl and all the characters are much more complex than that. They are. I'd like to talk about Beth, actually, because she is definitely more complex than that. It's a fascinating portrait. She is a victim of her time in the sense of where she comes from. It's hard to watch that from the perspective of our time when she, for example, pretends that she and Francine are friends, uses the word friends, when <laughs> Francine obviously doesn't think this. She's worked for she is the maid. And she tries to give Francine a chafing dish when they're moving out, right, that she no longer requires. I had to look up what a chafing dish was. <laughs> yes, I agree. It's um, something to do with entertaining. And of course, Francine has absolutely no use for a chafing dish. So she's sort of colorblind, forgive the pun, about this gap between them, isn't she? But as you said, she's well-meaning, isn't she? Totally. And it's not coincidence that Bruce has chosen a chafing dish. He's chosen a chafing dish because a chafing dish is an indicator of a certain standing within society, a certain level of wealth where you would be able to host a group of people and serve them out of silverware. Whereas Francine and her family, I'm sure, have large gatherings, but they wouldn't serve out of silverware in the same way. And so later, when that same chafing dish comes back and is, is re-offered by Bev to Albert at the end of the first act, he actually goes so far as to say, we don't want your things, we have our own things. And to sort of explain it as clearly as that, that they aren't charity cases just because they work for a white family. They're capable of, of having their own things. And, and Albert, in fact, has a Pontiac car. Yes, exactly. I think that's one of the um, subtle indications of the unconscious bias, because Bev just assumes they will need stuff and that they'd be grateful to have their stuff. As you said, Albert 
turns up in a car and the reverend looks out and says, you own a car? He's surprised he owns a car? So there's this automatic assumption of white superiority, clearly. That's right. Yeah. But let's talk about Bev, as you said, because initially you think she's almost simple-minded in her naivete. Bev seems a bit like a caricature of a 1950s TV wholesome housewife. And she's determinedly cheerful and she exchanges these terrible jokes with the reverend is offering everyone iced tea. But there's way more to her than that, isn't there? Because one of the nice touches as well, you mentioned the chafing dish. She's not using the chafing dish anymore because they're not entertaining anymore because of what's happened to them in the neighborhood. Their son has killed himself, which is a disgrace or difficult in itself. But also he was guilty of war crimes in Korea. Mm -hmm. So I guess they're shamed as well and shunned by their community. Absolutely. And therefore she isn't entertaining. So she's carrying, in fact, this huge grief and pain that means she's far more, as you said, a three-dimensional character than the, the caricature I was starting to describe. And as you said, she actually starts to express some of the principles of tolerance, which are admirable and which the others are not displaying, albeit in a relatively clunky and naive way. But she is a voice in a way of that from the playwright, isn't she? Absolutely. And she also stands up against the men in the scene. She argues against Carl, who is the force in the room, you know, even more so than her husband is, who removes himself from the conversation. You know, she, she becomes an ally, essentially, to the younger family, where Jim, the priest, in his way, is trying to explain why a black family perhaps wouldn't want to live in a white neighborhood. And Carl is explaining from his perspective why they don't want a black family to live in the neighborhood. And so, you know, there's all of these discussions going on in front of a black couple, which makes it even more excruciating and uncomfortable. And then the black couple are brought into the conversation to be used as examples almost uh, and this is, you know, one of the conversations that we had almost as a, a sort of exhibit A in this, what turns into a kind of professorial debate between white attitudes. Yes, the word excruciating is spot on. This moment when they, the Reverend, I think in particular, decides he's going to turn to Francine and Albert and ask them, what would they feel moving in to be the only black family in this white neighborhood? And classic lines about, you know, well, wouldn't it be difficult because you couldn't get the foods you like to eat in our local grocery store? The white people think that the black people will eat differently. And Bev's answer to that ultimately, of course, is thinking, well, maybe we should learn what the other person eats if someday we could all sit down at one big table. As I say, simple-minded, but actually there's a truth in there, of course, about learning more about each other. Absolutely, yeah. And and it's it's interesting that that line because of everything that comes before it almost elicits an eye roll from the audience, despite the fact that it's coming from a place of genuine support for the idea of change. But it's, it's because of how it's deployed and because of how we see these things being deployed, once again, through a contemporary lens, you know, our audience can't help but just groan at the efforts of Beth towards the end of the act. Yeah, although it's it's a very sad moment in some ways, because in the text, it actually says, if someday we could all sit down at one big table, and it, she just trails off. Mm. She doesn't finish it. She actually realizes it's hopeless, this. Yes. Yeah. She's saying it to Albert. Albert knows it's hopeless. They are not going to sit down at the same table. So it's a very sad truth as well. And there's a sadness to her, isn't there, about her suffering, obviously her grief. The loss of her son, she's also, in a sense, lost her husband. As you said, he absents himself from all of this discussion. He's sitting listlessly in the chair at the beginning of the play, clearly in the depths of depression, and is raging against his neighbors as well, of course, and that comes out. But not paying much attention to her either, is he? No, and it, it's interesting, such a specific choice for Bruce to have the white woman and the black man talking about how to spark progress to people who in that society are as good as impotent. So it's all well and good them having that conversation or wanting to make this change, but neither of them have the capacity to actually 
do anything. Yeah, just for the interval, at the end of the first act, Bev and Russ are left back alone in the house, talking again about moving to their new house, and he's going to start his new job. And he's going to be, you know, out in the office between nine and five. And she says rather poignantly, and what will I do in between? Because she's moving to a new neighborhood where she knows no one. She hasn't got a job. Her family doesn't exist anymore. What is there for her in her life as a 50s housewife? Mm -hmm. I found that quite telling and poignant. Yeah, it is. Even though, you know, she's been in a way the sort of butt of the thing for most of the first half of this. But I think it's deeper than that, isn't it? Absolutely. It is for all of them as well. And we get an insight into how the men, you know, what the men think of her earlier in a conversation where they talk about how she gets overexcited and how, you know, how she likes to keep occupied or needs a project to keep her occupied, which is what the moving, the house moving is. It's so patronizing. Yeah. But I mean, it's, you know, it was the age. That was her lot. Exactly. And all of that is necessary to discuss in Act One in order to make the contrasts deeper in Act Two. Yeah, because I was fascinated by, we talked about the characters in the play. The women are almost more interesting in some ways. Francine and then Lena in the second act. So Francine, through the first act, by contrast to Bev, she doesn't say a lot. But she's got a powerful presence, doesn't she? Absolutely, yes. There are only two black actors in a cast of seven. And what that does is helps to, as you say, make their presence more powerful. It makes the conversations harder and it makes them land more heavily for the audience. Because if those people were out of the room or elsewhere, it's that out of sight, out of mind attitude. Whereas here, by having them right there in the midst of the conversation, it makes the whole thing much, much more urgent, I think, and raises the stakes for everyone. Yes. It's interesting because I kept thinking, and I'm trying to think how to express this as an image, but the play seems to be more about white prejudice than from the Black perspective. It's, it's setting the Black characters as the screen against which we witness the white character's behavior and judge it. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, Francine has this sort of distance, doesn't she? She she keeps herself to herself largely, but you know what her perspective is. Yeah. She realizes her position in relation to, to Bev, as we said earlier. And when that when it gets out of hand and she's listening to this behavior and these arguments, she says, I think they're all a bunch of idiots. Let them knock each other's brains out for all I care. I mean, she's two days away from completing her employment with Bev because they're moving away and, you know, she sees it straight. But the second half of the play, it satirizes the white self-professed liberals who present themselves as enlightened. <laughs> this particularly Lindsay and Steve, but who do not have a comfortable way to talk about race. You can still see that they're acting like it's a minefield they cannot tread carefully enough through. Yeah. Well, it's what's interesting about it, I think, is th this idea that it's observed as opposed to experienced. And so they try to convey what they're and, or sort of teach. I think at one point, Bruce even writes in stage directions that either Lindsay or Steve delivers a line pedagogically. You know, it, it's with such emphasis on trying to teach about somebody else's experience. And it's just <laughs> patronizing as well. <laughs> Yeah. Well, yeah, Lindsay's doing that all the time to Steve, isn't she? Because she can't bear that he he seems to set himself up as one of those who wants to not be constrained by political correctness, to be the only one in the room to, to say the truth, to identify the elephant in the room. Mm -hmm. And she finds this excruciating, unbearable and wants to keep shutting him down. Yeah. And she keeps trying to profess somehow her qualifications as an enlightened person, doesn't she? When she falls into that classic trap of saying half my friends are black and not being able to name more than two, one of whom works in her office. So it, you know, clearly a target for that sort of satire. But then it gets, you know, it gets pretty ugly, doesn't it? When Lena ostensibly representing this housing association saying, really what we object to is you're going to build a house that's too tall. At some point, Steve decides that what she's really saying is they object to them as a white couple moving into their black neighborhood. 
Why does Steve interpret it this way? Is, is he being overly sensitive that race must be the card she's playing? Or is she really playing the card? <laughs> oh, Douglas, you're asking me to pull the curtain back now. You've been the one who's torn this play apart. I'd love to know how you came at it. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, I'm sure if, if you were talking to the actors, they would each have a different opinion on how this line of events transpires. And it's because we try not to judge the characters. So the idea of whether Steve is being overly sensitive or not, I guess, is sort of up to Andy, Andy Langtry, who plays the character. What we can follow is that the conversation begins somewhere, which is about the height and the size of the house, but that we know that actually uh, much of that paperwork has been filed too late. And so actually the chances of stopping Steve and Lindsay from doing what they want to do on a legal basis are quite thin. So Lena deploys talking about the history of the community and her family's experience and what that is in order to do essentially what Carl does in the first act, which is appeal to the hearts and minds of Lindsay and Steve and to try and stop them from changing the face of the neighborhood. And it's in having that conversation about this idea of changing the face of a neighborhood that Steve interprets that to mean, well, we know that this neighborhood is predominantly black. So what you're suggesting is that us coming in as a white family is the issue. And so takes it down that line. Now, Lena never admits that that's what she's saying. Personally, I don't think it is. I think it is about the size of the house and changing the face of the neighborhood. I think if the white family were to come in, and maintain the facade of the house, I think it would be a different conversation. But it's also about this idea of gentrification, this idea of taking the opportunity of this house being owned and lived in by a black family away. So it's, it's more complex. It's kind of a combination of all sorts of reasons and attitudes, and also the fact that the attitudes become quite clear quite early. And again, this idea of trying to protect what's mine, what's ours. You're right. It isn't explicitly just race. It is about gentrification too, isn't it? Because the way that Bruce Norris actually shows us the history of this neighborhood evolving in economic terms is important so that we have this process of gentrification, you know, wealthier people coming in and transforming a neighborhood and then making it unaffordable for others. The irony is that in the first act, Carl is worried that the neighborhood's values will decline if one house is allowed to be transformed. And the reverse happens in the second where Lena thinks the whole gentrification domino will be initiated if one house is bought and allowed to be transformed in this way. That's it. And they, they do also have in the second act the conversation about value. And Bruce sort of drills down into that through Steve as to whether Lena is talking about monetary value. And she says she's talking about historical value because Steve wants to make it clear that if they build their house, it's not going to devalue the area. It's potentially going to increase the value of the area. And so again, Bruce bringing back this discussion, this debate over what is more valuable, is it money or is it society essentially, community? Yes, and that point about community is, of course, is there is a suggestion that these demographic changes that occur over generations in neighborhoods and in countries, it's not just based on the color of your skin, obviously. So how do we expect people to integrate or assimilate or not, that people who come who are different? So they cite Gelman's grocery store. And I love this. Occasionally, as I mentioned about the local grocery store owned by Gelman, and what a nice man Galman was. You know, you're partly going, what's the point of that reference? But there is a point to that reference. Yes, absolutely. The suggestion here is that Galman was Jewish. That is, is Carl's argument for how theirs is a progressive society or progressive community because they let him in and he chose to or was able to, as Carl puts it, fit in. And so it's this idea of one having to change themselves in order to be able to fit in. And there is an argument that, you know, Mr. Gelman may have been able to pass for having been a white Caucasian man, you know, that wasn't Jewish. So that would be acceptable, whereas that's obviously not something that this other family can do, even if they do eat the same foods. 
Yeah, although, you know, I mean, they're all still, it would seem, acutely aware that Gelman is different. That's right. But the whole idea of, as Carl says, fitting in to a community is really what it all comes down to. You know, that we insist on this, that we're only comfortable when we're in communities of like-minded people, with people the same as us, birds of a feather and all that. I mean, the thing is, it was after Brexit that I decided I needed to do this play. Because as much as I loved it in 2013, it was my own experience of seeing the country that I was born and had grown up in as a mixed race person completely shatter and fracture in front of me. And that this kind of underlying racism came to the surface where we had synagogues being graffitied and kebab shops being firebombed in the immediate aftermath of Brexit, because there seemed to be this belief system amongst extremists that everybody felt similar to them. So they could suddenly start behaving appallingly. And so there was this sort of upsurge in what were previously underlying attitudes of racism or this sense of, well, we've now proven that this country is ours and everybody should understand that. Yeah. I mean, obviously the idea of shutting the door of immigration yeah. Of people who are the incomers are disturbing our way of life. People are uncomfortable with change that results from the interchange of peoples. That's right. And so this idea of kind of taking back control of our borders and sort of shutting the borders is then going to sort of stop that from happening. I'm afraid we might get diverted into spending quite a long time talking about the politics of Brexit. I wanted to ask you at the very beginning, we talked about what is offensive or not. Everybody's careful about the language because they realize that, that they may offend. But then it ratchets up in the second half to an amazing sequence, which is quite close to the bone. And the audience were laughing uproariously, <laughs> where there's a sequence of offensive jokes. Steve gets himself backed in the corner where he has to tell a joke about a black man in prison that, you know, Lindsay is, thinks is excruciatingly offensive. We're talking about relatively serious issues, terms which could be offensive, and yet you're also managing it as the director to create laughs. It's, it's comic, isn't it? How do you reconcile those things going on here in that part of the play? Well, it's interesting. As we were in rehearsal, Jimmy Carr made the headlines for making his joke about gypsies and the Holocaust. And there was a big conversation over what can or can't be joked about. And this is something that I've listened to Ricky Gervais talk about and David Baddiel talking about this idea of offence and what is offensive and what you can or can't joke about. And many of those top level comedians believe that there is nothing that is off the table. They believe that their only responsibility is that the joke is good. And that is actually what Lena says in Clybourne in response to Steve's joke, because Steve asks directly, are you offended? Is that offensive? And Lena says, no, the problem with that joke is that it's not funny. But it may not be funny to those it's offending. How do you judge what's a good joke or an effective joke? That's right. And she interestingly, as a black woman, isn't involved in the content of the joke at all. So in theory, she is objectively able to uh, assess the joke in and of itself. But, you know, the classic objection would be that it's just perpetuating racial stereotypes, which are unhelpful. That's right. So, you know, you can see if you want to take a strict objective view of what the intent and meaning of the joke is, that's what it's doing. For sure. But the comedians and everyone is arguing that that's permissible. Steve says at some point that that's the point of a joke is to permit the expression of. <laughs> and he doesn't finish it. And I was going to ask you to permit the expression of what? <laughs> what are jokes supposed to be allowed to be able to do that we may not even be able to do in other contexts? Well, I think context is, is so important. And that's the other thing that these comedians talk about in great detail is that you know, we talk about the setup of a joke and the reason that a joke is set up in the way that it is and we don't just deliver a punchline is so that people understand the context and the fact that we are now engaging in a theatrical moment, if you like. And so the rules, therefore, are different uh, in the same way that they are for us as theatre makers. We set up our space and our stage and our the way in which we choose to tell a story and the audience, therefore, agree 
to our terms because we're the people that put them in place. So I suppose the audience to a joke are by sticking around and waiting for the punchline, agreeing to the terms of the joke teller. Yeah, and they're agreeing that, that by convention, the rules are, there are no rules. Right, exactly. <laughs> well, yes, I mean... That you're allowed, that somehow comedy can be a place to allow baser human behavior or sentiments or ideas to be aired. Yes, absolutely. And to be intellectually explored as well, because a lot of stand-up comedy now is much more conversational than it used to be, rather than just joke after joke after joke. It's a sort of more detailed exposition around ideas, which gives comedians the opportunity to explore themes and topics and subjects, but in a way that is understood by the audience and by the comedian to be an acceptable format in which to have this conversation. And it's interesting to describe it as a conversation because naturally it isn't uh, because there's only one person speaking. <laughs> but I suppose <laughs> in many respects, it's considered a conversation nonetheless. You know, a lot of it's satire. And actually the intent of the joke is the reverse of what seems to being said. Well, yeah. So within the context of the play, I think Steve is using it to basically explain in a similar way to the way that Carl makes an argument in the first act about how he has the right to speak. Steve makes an argument in the second act, and both characters are played by the same actor, that he has a right to tell any joke that he wants to tell. The whole cancel culture is, is sort of referenced in a way, isn't it? To be allowed by someone else to say something you disagree with. Yes, absolutely. And Within the context of the play, Steve is doing exactly that. He's essentially trying to prove that anybody should be able to say what they want to say without concern of offending somebody else. Ricky Gervais talks about people not having the right not to be offended because, because what that leads to is people then not having the right to say something. And so actually what they're trying to do is to protect freedom of speech. In terms of the joke itself, it depends what you want to take away from it. Is it a conversation over a debate around masculinity? There's race. There's a question about rape. You know, it's so complex that, that I suppose it depends what somebody wants to take away from it. I think the point I was trying to make was that actually, because as you rightly say, of the context, when it's a joke and we're all aware that this is a joke, in fact, some of the content of the joke, because it's a joke, is intended to say the reverse of what you think it's about. It's knowing, the joke is knowing that they're playing with this sort of stereotype. And you know that, and therefore you think differently. You don't automatically accept the stereotype. In fact, you're being asked to challenge it. Absolutely. Well, also the use of stereotype means that it should be accessible to a wider audience. That's true. Okay, let's change tack slightly. Well, greatly, because rather than comedy, I wanted to ask you about war and Kenneth, the figure of Kenneth. The play is dominated by the issues we've touched on about race and property and ethnic integration. So I wonder how you feel that the plot line about Russ and Bev's son, Kenneth, sits within the play. Because in some senses, it feels quite different in theme and tone, perhaps. Why do you think he includes that? And how does it fit in within the play? Well, so 1950s America, we're in post-war, post-Second World War boom, where the white middle class was sort of established as being this opportunity to pursue the American dream. So for that to be in any way dismantled, Bruce needs something big. He needs this, this family to have experienced something big. In the 50s, certainly in the UK, suicide was a crime. I don't know whether it was in America at that time, but it was certainly frowned upon or, or, as you mentioned earlier, shameful. The other thing is that what it does is it enables Carl to try to create a sense of common experience with Russ because Carl and Betsy have previously lost a child uh, during the pregnancy uh, where the umbilical cord was trapped around the neck, which obviously references the way in which Kenneth hanged himself. So there are, once again, commonalities there that Bruce uses in order to try to create an opportunity for these characters to meet on some level. But also that level of grief that Russ, interestingly, Bev talks about how she expected after two and a half years, Russ to have sort of managed his grief 
to me, that's Bruce touching on the idea of the way in which men deal with grief and deal with depression um, and how they don't talk about their feelings. And so Bev, who we can assume has some somehow found an outlet to talk about how she feels, whether it's with Francine, who is another woman who happens to be in the house every day, or whether it's with other female friends. But we also know that Bev has a relationship with Jim, the priest, so she can speak to him. So she has had outlets for her grief. Russ hasn't. And so all Russ has done is dug into that and it's put him in the depths of this depression. So from a a sort of theatrical standpoint, it gives Russ and Bev a level of weight that you talked about before. It gives them something to really push back against or an urgency, I, I suppose, for them to do what they're doing and selling the house and moving on. And it also gives Bruce the opportunity in Act 2 to talk about war and what war is, which is the usurping of territory. One group, one tribe, as he describes it, taking territory, taking land away or property away. And it was day one or two of rehearsal for this that Russia invaded Ukraine. And so it felt hugely topical, unfortunately, It was striking, as you say. I mean, you couldn't but sit in the audience now and think about what's going on in Ukraine. And I think the other point was about the American dream and how Kenneth has been a casualty of that, because I think there's a reference to him being unable to get a job. Mm -hmm. And of course, he has been disgraced by what he's done, the implication that he's killed innocent civilians, women and children even, in the line of duty, to which Russ exclaims, what do you think happens in a goddamn war? They told him to secure the territory, not go knocking on doors, asking permission. And we know all too well that this is what goes on. You know, obviously it has this immediate resonance with Ukraine. But in 2009, when this second act is taking place, this is six years into the Iraq war. And, you know, there will be views, obviously, in America about what went on there. And in every generation, the Vietnam veterans, the Iraq veterans coming back into society has always been challenging you know, a country asks them to go and do these brutal things. They don't really want to know about the detail of these brutal things. They have to go beyond what is acceptable. And then they may pay the price for the rest of their lives in various ways. So it's a very serious topic. And it's only just under the skin of this in a way, I suppose. I mean, it's overt in that Kenneth is a figure who returns at the end of the play. And I wanted to ask you about this ending. Kenneth's figure appears and has a conversation with his mother. He's clearly writing his suicide letter to his parents. When then her final line is, I really believe things are about to change for the better. I don't think Norris is as optimistic about the future as Bev is, is he? (laughs) No, indeed. And I think that that essentially is his way of summarizing the entire play, that in spite of everything. So let's take Kenneth as an example. So he's gone to war at a young age, probably in his late teens. Um, I think he's 19. He has a, an horrific experience, ends up killing civilians, getting court martials. So there's nothing more shameful than that at that time. But even now for a military person, having to try to reintegrate into society where he becomes a pariah, is unable to get a job, so is not able to pursue the American dream. In spite of all of that, Bev's decision, Bev's choice, is to suggest that things are going to get better. And so I think Bruce is essentially saying, well, we blinker ourselves in spite of the carnage around us. Yes, I mean, it's obviously deeply ironic. It's literally on the verge of his going to carry out his suicide. But I think it also refers, doesn't it, overall to what you said about the chap you sat behind in the theatre at the very beginning of this conversation. What goes around comes around. (laughs) I mean, that's what the play's demonstrated and we're seeing in our own life, our own world. Yeah, and I think part of the reason I was galvanised to further investigate and ultimately direct the play is that I just don't think that we can shrug it off like that. And I think that that's sort of what Bruce wants us to try and avoid as well is is the capacity that we have as as human beings to assume that things can only get better you know and that they just will by some sort of default whereas the reality is that actually we have to enact change rather than hope for the best 
Well, it reminded me of this being 2009, and you mentioned earlier the Obama administration, of course, his famous line that he believes we are on an arc bending towards justice in the long run. And yeah, love to believe that. <laughs> and deep down, what other alternative have we but to try and believe that and act towards it? That's right. But in the short term, there are times, as this play suggests, of course, that our baser instincts do not change. We are not very tolerant and distrust others. We protect our own nest out of ignorance, of course, which is the irony is the self-fulfilling ignorance, the, the inevitable result of our limiting contact with other people as we know less about other people and then fear them as much because of our ignorance. Totally. And, and it struck me when I returned to North Carolina because I ended up working for Playmakers a couple of years later. And I spoke to one of the women who was running a youth project there. And she talked about how because I was talking about the integration of the black kids and the Hispanic kids and the white kids within this room where she was running an activity. And she said, well, no, actually, we encourage them not to mix. We encourage them to understand their own people and their own culture. And, and that way, they'll better understand how the world sees them, which I found to be particularly with a British sensibility in 2015, whenever it was, that really struck me that actually what we're doing is encouraging our kids in America, you know, in this particular example, to separate rather than integrate. And that was a 21st century attitude. So are we somehow going to end up going backwards? Well, I mean, you know, there's understanding where you come from and allegiances to that, but ultimately it can't be rigid and exclusive. That way is disaster. Well, yeah. And yet it was her experience as a black woman in America who felt that she needed to explain to her kids that it doesn't matter that they have a degree and that they are intelligent and fun and friendly and charming, but that they need to know that, you know, if they get pulled over, they are just what they appear to be. You know, so we talk about self-perpetuating cycles, and that feels like one to me, as well as being a defense mechanism against the society that they find themselves in which I think is why this play is as important as it is and why it's important to remind ourselves. I think people often on one reading or one viewing of Clybourne see Bruce as targeting the people who represent other within this story. Whereas my belief fundamentally is that, you know, we've talked a lot about comedy and Bruce is, is all about the comedy within the play. But my belief is that he's asking us to laugh at the speaker, not at the subject. And that's really, really important because often that's not what we necessarily assume. Of course. Oliver, we've run way over time. I'm conscious that you're supposed to be on holiday down there in Wales. <laughs> Thank you so much. One more quick thing before I let you go. One of the traditions of the podcast is that I like to ask my guests to recommend another play that we might talk about in a future episode, or one that's just a personal favorite of yours, maybe you've directed it, or one you'd love to direct one day? Well, actually, I don't know if, you, if you've talked about it before, and it might have to be a few months before you talk about another one of his plays, but Downstate is a play that, for me, it was another that I found to be earth-shattering. Bruce's capacity to get me as an audience member to care about these characters. I literally left during the interval and turned to my friend, and I said, there's no way he's going to get me to care about these people. And if that's what he's trying to do, he's going to fail. <laughs> <laughs> and it's remarkable what he achieves in the second. He won. Play. He really does. He does. Yeah. I just reread it this week, actually. And uh, you're right. It's a very unsettling piece and fascinating. So, yes, very good suggestion. Thank you. You're welcome. And thank you, Oliver, for your time and your insights. Thanks for having me. And have a great holiday. Thank you. As the curtain falls on the contentious property transactions, do we imagine, as Bev hopes, that things are about to change for the better? It seems unlikely if we remain shuttered in our exclusive habitats and fixed attitudes, fearful of change, especially by the infiltration or interaction with people not from our tribe, about whom we will inevitably remain ignorant if we never meet or mix with them. After all, as Bev says, we all deserve the opportunity to find a secure and peaceful home. Thanks for listening. See you next time. Thanks for listening. To listen to other episodes, to find out news about future episodes, 
or to leave comments about what you've heard, please visit us at www.theplaypodcast.com. You can also follow us on Facebook or on Twitter at The Play Pod. You're also welcome to email plays at theplaypodcast.com to suggest plays that we could talk about in future episodes. You can also register your suggestion on the website. Thanks again, and see you next time.